The Apostles' Creed reflects the Trinitarian character of the Christian faith. The Trinity is not an added-on doctrine, a dispensable teaching, but it is related to the very heart and essence of Christianity itself. It's the DNA of the Christian faith. Without the Trinity, there is no Christianity. And the Apostles' Creed reflects the faith and the prayer and the devotion of the early Christian believers who came to see and serve and understand this one eternal God who is one in essence and three in person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, we find very short statements of faith. For example, Jesus is Lord. But that was not seen to be enough. More was needed. And so gradually we find these creeds beginning to evolve along a Trinitarian pattern. Something about God the Father, something about God the Son, something about God the Spirit, and of course the whole business of the Christian life. From the very earliest times of the Christian faith, there was a strong sense throughout the community of believers who quickly spread over quite a bit of the then known world that they were rooted in certain events which had actually happened, things which had happened to do with Jesus of Nazareth, things in which they believed the one true God of all the world had been active to save the world once and for all. And they believed that these things that had happened actually shaped what the meaning of the word God itself really was. And so from very early on, as early as the first documents we find in the New Testament, we find the early Christians exploring the meaning of who God is in certain definable ways closely connected with Jesus and with the gift of the Holy Spirit. As a Christian, I believe in one God. One of the early church fathers said that whenever we start talking about the Trinity, we must immediately think of the one God. And as soon as we think of the one God, we must immediately remember Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's a kind of toing and froing all the time in true Christian belief between the real statement, God is one, and the recognition he's revealed to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God is indivisible, but that he is also three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, totally united. So, as a Christian, I see in God total unity, but also a genuine personal diversity. And this is set forth in the creed. The creed itself derives its structure from those, that verse at the end of St. Matthew, when Jesus tells his disciples to go into all the world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, the word Trinity is not actually used in the Apostles' Creed, just as the word Trinity does not actually occur in the New Testament. The Bible doesn't give us a clear systematic statement about God as Trinity, though there are plenty of hints and allusions to it in the Bible. The fact that God has forever known himself and in history has revealed himself to us as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father who creates, the Son who redeems, and the Spirit who sanctifies and gives new life in Christ. The idea of a plurality in God is prefigured in the Old Testament. You have God and his wisdom, for instance, and wis his wisdom in, in Proverbs uh, is seen as something sort of um, almost over against God and yet is God. You have the angel of the Lord in the book of uh, Exodus, chapter 33, 
But at the foot of the mountain, Moses speaks with the Lord as one speaks to a friend face to face. Then further up the mountain, he's again speaking to the Lord. But there he says, I want to see your face. And the Lord's reply comes, my face you cannot see, for no man can see me and live. So we have to ask ourselves then, you know, are both these beings the, of the deity? They are, they are. One is the Father and one is the Son. A little bit further on, you get the reference to the Spirit of God as well. So that the Trinity is all there from the very, very start, right back to Genesis. There are these figures, the, these elements in the Old Testament, which with hindsight we can see as pointing forward to the Trinity. Already this teaching is reflected, foreshadowed in the Old Testament, and it comes to full fruition in the life and ministry of Jesus. We see this especially at His baptism, when the voice of the Father speaks from heaven, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, comes and descends upon Christ. We can understand the doctrine of the Trinity in the context of salvation history. The Bible is written against the backdrop of many gods. In the Old Testament, Yahweh is the one God. But the, the gods of the Canaanites, the, the gods of Babylon, the, the gods of the Egyptians, there is the one God who is the creator of heaven and earth. The great difference in the Old Testament between the Hebrews' God and the other gods is that the other gods were localized gods. They had particular functions associated by and large with nature. But Yahweh, the Hebrew God, is maker of heaven and earth. He is God over all the gods. They are God, small g. He is capital G. When we come to the New Testament, um, the backdrop there is, is Greek and Roman gods, and there are many gods. Uh, but here you again have the one God in continuity with the Old Testament God, Yahweh, but going a step beyond because God manifests Himself. He comes to us as a human being. Why did they take that route when they wanted to say that we are monotheists, not pagan polytheists? Wasn't that a risk to say, um, you know, that this is the, the threefold thing that's going here, Father, Son, and Spirit? And the answer is it is all because of Jesus that somehow they were forced to say this human being, Jesus of Nazareth, is both identical with the God who made heaven and earth and yet somehow to be distinguished from him because Jesus himself prayed to that God, calling him Abba. And gradually the disciples realize that he is not simply a human teacher. He is indeed truly human. But they realize that he also has a unique relationship with God his Father. They come to believe that he is indeed himself also God. It was a big jump um, for Jews nurtured on the Old Testament to ascribe deity, especially to a human being, was um, really a, a very big jump. And in fact, it's argued that the recognition of the deity of Christ in the New Testament comes first with the worship of Jesus. And that actually is also interesting because it points out that doctrine is not just about ideas in the head. In fact, it, it, it was worship, it's the way we relate to God and at that level that um, uh, was the unfolding way in which they came to appreciate who Jesus was and, and that he was more than just a, a, a great prophet. Incredible, impossible seemingly, God becomes one with us, truly human, truly a man. God becomes one with us. And, and the New Testament goes beyond that because this God, man, whom we call Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, he ascends and is gone. But God in some way is still with us and he is called now God the Holy Spirit. The Spirit who is given to dwell in our hearts is the Spirit of Jesus and yet Jesus remains 
a genuinely human being who is over against us. He is our Lord. It isn't just that Jesus lives in us and uh, without remainder. Jesus is different from us as well. So it's because of Jesus they were forced to say from very, very early on that we have to talk in a threefold way about the one God. Once you've established the deity of Christ, you've established that you have God the Father, God the Son, and fitting in the Holy Spirit may take a bit longer, but um, the basic principle is established. The Holy Spirit, of course, is active from the first creation of the world, but when he is sent on the day of Pentecost to the disciples, he is revealed in a new way, and the early Christians become convinced that the Holy Spirit is not simply a force, not simply an atmosphere, but that he is also truly a person and that he is God. After the ascension of Christ into heaven, that the Spirit was the mode in which God was near to us, that the Holy Spirit is fully divine, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, and that throughout history, Old Testament, New Testament, the Spirit is present. Many people think of the Trinity as just a sort of um, abstract doctrine or something that has no practical relevance for Christian life. And I suppose I would have to say that at times it's been put over in that sort of way as a very sort of um, formal and theoretical doctrine. But actually, you, you can't read the New Testament at all without the Trinity, because just to think of the very basic facts, um, why did Jesus come? Well. God, God the Father, so loved the world that he gave his only Son. Right, Father and Son. Without those two, nothing would have happened. And then when Jesus uh, rose and ascended, he gave the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's the Trinity. And as Christians, God is our Father. Um, we are in Christ. We have the Holy Spirit who, who leads us and directs us. It's all to do with the Trinity. That We have the three persons of the Trinity involved in our salvation. Of course, you have God who's the author, God the Father who's the author, but then you have Jesus Christ who's the agent of our salvation by virtue of his death and resurrection and the gift of the Spirit. Then you have the Holy Spirit who's the activator of our salvation by applying it personally to individuals here, there, and everywhere. You just can't read the New Testament at all properly without an understanding of the Trinity. I am happy to rest in the idea of the Trinity as three persons in one God, co-equals but with different roles. We are confronted here by a strange paradox, something that cannot be entirely explained in logical terms that we can only really begin to understand through prayer. Sometimes we have to stop using words and just to be silent before the divine mystery. Thomas Akempis once said that it's great to study about the Trinity and read about the Trinity, but far, far better to love the Trinity. And I would invite you to enter into that love of God God who is love and who has shared himself with us in such a generous and lavish way. God indeed created us to be in that loving union with, with God, that, that the relationship of God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are something of that same reality. God is love, says St. John in his first epistle, fourth chapter. But self-love, the love of one turned inwards, is not the fullness of love. In our human experience, love implies exchange. Love implies another person. It implies an I and thou relationship. So instead of self-love, what we see in God is shared love, mutual love. If we are able to say that God is love and that it is in the nature of God, 
because he is three persons, you can't have a relationship of love between one, but you can between three. God is not just the monad loving himself. God is three, three persons from all eternity loving one another. God is exchange, self-giving. This is what the doctrine of the Trinity says to me. Therefore, it has a very immediate consequence for the way I understand my own personhood. As a person, I only become myself if I relate to others in love after the image of the Trinity. In fact, perhaps one of the most amazing statements in the scriptures is in the 17th chapter of John's Gospel, where we have what's called Jesus' high priestly prayer, where he's praying for us, particularly for, for us. Because in verse 20 of that 17th chapter of John, he says, I'm not praying only for these, and that's the 11 he's been praying for, but for all of those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. And what does he pray? That they may all be one. Now, is he talking about a theological unity? Or is he talking about a doctrinal unity? Is he talking about an ecclesiastical unity? Is he talking about a, a liturgical unity? No, he describes what he's talking about. He prays that they may all be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you. Jesus' prayer for his followers is that they would be in the same relationship of loving union with God that he is. And when you get to the end of that prayer, down in verse 23, he says that the world may know that you have loved them just as you have loved me. Another way of saying that God's love for us is exactly the same as God's love for Jesus, and that the desire here is that we would be in the same relationship of loving union. So that with Jesus, we, we get this relational idea. Now, Jesus doesn't bring the Holy Spirit in at that point, but again in John's Gospel, you know, Jesus breathes upon them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. So that whether we're talking about God, Jesus, or the Holy Spirit, we're, we're talking about the same reality. And, and you, th there are so many different facets to that reality. I mean, we can talk about it in terms of, well, you know, God is, is in heaven, here's Jesus, you know, incarnate on earth, the Holy Spirit is present with us now. Um, th those are just facets of trying to deal with a, a holistic reality, a triunity that escapes human cognition. We cannot comprehend it, because if we could, if we could understand Trinity perfectly, we would be God, because we would have encompassed God within our human rationality. So the Trinity isn't just about um, working out theoretical formulations about you know, three persons and all the rest of it and so on, although that has its place, but it's just about reading the New Testament and seeing how we meet there the one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's there on almost every page of the New Testament. What we find from the earliest Christian writings we have, namely the letters of Paul, is that even when Paul is trying to say, there is one God, it keeps on coming out in two or three ways. He talks about the Father and the Lord, or God and the Son and the Spirit. There's one wonderful passage in Galatians chapter 4, which is actually full of Exodus language, so it's going back to the book of Exodus, um, like so much else in the New Testament, when he says that when the time had fully come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman born under the law, and then because you are God's sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so that you are now no longer slaves, but children and heirs of God. And then he immediately says, now that you've come to know God, or rather be known by God, how come you're turning away to pagan-style deities instead? This is Galatians 4, verses 4 through 8, 9, 10. In other words, you've got a choice from the very earliest days of the church. You are either going to go with the God who you've come to know as the one who sends the Son and the one who sends the Spirit of the Son, or you're going back 
to some form of paganism. And that is the beginning of what we Christians call Trinitarian theology. What happens is that as people go on, they begin to experience God in different ways. And the only way the early Christians who'd grown up with this very strong belief that God was one, the only way that the early Christians could describe God after the coming of Jesus and after Pentecost in the coming of the Holy Spirit was to say, yes, God is one. Uh, monotheism is absolutely at the heart of our faith. There are not three gods, but God is experienced as three distinct persons, equally and fully God. But he is the Father, and he is the Son whom we see in Jesus Christ, and then after the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, he is the Holy Spirit whom we still know at work in our world today. And the Holy Spirit makes Jesus real and alive to us, the teaching of Jesus, and it is Jesus who is the mediator, the divine agent to connect us sinful human beings to the Father. So all is in the hands at the end of time of the Father. The Son and the Spirit submit in a right way to him, but are not less than him. They are all fully God. That is, of course, mind-blowing. It was mind-blowing in the first century, and it's mind-blowing still. But it's all because of Jesus that they had to differentiate between Father and Son and Spirit. And in a sense, that remains the glorious central task of all Christian worship, as well as theology, uh, to explore and elaborate and celebrate the threeness as well as the oneness of God. One way you might say this is that all that we know of God is in the Father. All that we have seen of God is in the Son. All that we feel or experience of God is in the Holy Spirit. One God, but coming to us in different ways. Now, this is not stated in quite that way here in the Creed, but this is what I see as underlying the Creed, this gradual development in God's revelation of himself. I think the key thing for people to realize today, and each generation has to realize this, is that when we say God, if we are Christians, we mean the God we know in Jesus who is present by the power of the Spirit. And we have to come back again and again. We think we know who Jesus is and we forget. We remake him in our own image. We've got to come back and look at the real Jesus and in the light of that, remodel what we mean by God and in the light of that, devote our lives in prayer and gratitude and service to him and his kingdom. sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. St. Paul concludes his second letter to the Corinthians with this beautiful prayer. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.